What's going on, everyone? Welcome to a Readsy Live. Uh, it's Wednesday again, and that means it's time for us to bring on another guest from the world of publishing to share their knowledge with you. Uh, my name is Martin. I'm part of the Readsy team based here in London. Uh, and tonight we've got a very special guest uh, who's bringing a fantastic webinar. He presented uh, in Las Vegas just a few weeks ago to uh, some of the uh, best and brightest minds uh, in self-publishing uh, in uh, I think I can't remember the name of the uh, webinar, but uh, my colleague Ricardo was there. Anyway, Alex Newton is here. Uh, Longtime viewers may remember him uh, from being here back in February, uh, where he shared some market insights uh, that he brought to the table thanks to his uh, analytics company, Klytics, which uh, digs into some of the data behind uh, book sales, especially with uh, the Amazon platforms. Uh, while we wait for him to join us in a few minutes, just tell us where you're from uh, and what sort of book you're working on. Uh, this might give us a bit of an idea how to tailor some of the, uh, the chat we have a little bit later on. I saw uh, Sally Rigby uh, from New Zealand writing crime fiction. I hope you can uh, hear me now uh, while we were waiting to load up. Uh, it was probably a bit quiet. Uh, Just Luke from Munich, Germany uh, has written a short story collection. Fantastic. Uh, Ryan from New Orleans uh, writing horror and historical fiction. Fantastic. Uh, Tammy from Gainesville, Florida. Welcome, Tammy. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, and Luana from Nova Scotia, uh, a re another return visitor. Uh, thank you so much. It means a lot uh, to see some uh, returning faces to these webinars. I hope you get a lot out of them. Uh, tonight's one, like our previous one, comes uh, straight from Las Vegas. We're bringing on uh, a book marketer, Alex Newton, uh, who will be able to dig into his uh, vault of uh, data to show you how to harness market forces to sell more books, as is the title of this webinar. Uh, we'll just wait a few more minutes for people to roll in. Uh, thank you for joining us on uh, YouTube. Uh, those of you who have been here with us uh, for a bit longer knew, uh, know that we were on Facebook Live for a while, uh, but I'm enjoying our time here on uh, on YouTube. It's uh, quite a nice little interface. I think uh, it's quite an easy thing to use and to tune into. Uh, uh, what's going to happen? We'll bring Alex on in just a few minutes. He's got a bit of a slide deck to show. Uh, and uh, towards the end, we're going to have a bit of a Q&A once he's done with all of that. Uh, so if you have any questions, you can either save them to the end, uh, or if um, they're sort of reacting to things he's talking about during the presentation, uh, just pop it in the chat. If uh, I think it might uh, sort of shed a bit of light on the conversation, I'll, uh, I'll post it on screen and uh, Alex, can, Alex can see it there. Uh, otherwise, uh, don't worry about taking notes. In just a few days, I should have uh, the replay of this presentation up along with a transcript. So if you miss anything, uh, you can always uh, go back and watch it at your own leisure uh, and even read it if you prefer. Uh, cool. Uh, who else is here? We have Linda from Houston. Uh, hey. Uh, Lois from Philly, Pennsylvania. Uh, Ariel from Phoenix, Arizona, writing fantasy science fiction. See a lot of fiction here. That's great, good stuff. Thrillers, romance, historical fiction, massive uh, genres uh, in self-publishing. Uh, Stacy from Winnipeg, self-help. Uh, we have Abby Zanders uh, from Pennsylvania, writing romance. Justine from Phoenix, historical romance. Sean, science fiction dystopia. Uh, hello to Patricia from Montreal, Canada. Welcome back, Pat. Uh, Mel, writing women's fiction on romance. Uh, hello. Mel Greenberg from Tucson and LA, maybe somewhere uh, on the road in between the two. Paul Mayo from Malvern Hills. Hey, Paul. Uh, Tony Keefe uh, from Mirrors, Mirrorsville, Washington. Uh, loads of people pouring in now. We've got about uh, 86 people, it seems, uh, joining us right now. Uh, I'll give it another minute or so before we bring Alex on. Thank you for spending this afternoon, uh, evening, morning with us. I really appreciate you. Uh, putting aside the time and uh, investing investing this time in learning more about self-publishing and uh, what it takes to to make a success of yourself uh, in this game we call publishing. Uh, we have historical romance from North Carolina. Hello. We have Wayne. Wayne Anson from Nebraska working on a second psychological thriller. Was it murdered by suicide? Ooh, fascinating. Uh, okay, it's just hit 8 o'clock where I am. Three o'clock on the East Coast, midday uh, on the West Coast. Uh, I'm going to bring on uh, Alex Newton. Give me a second for him to come on live. Hey, Alex, how are you doing? Oh, just wait. 
Good I'm morning, muted. wherever you are. Hi. Sorry, I've unmuted you now. There we go. So again, good evening, good afternoon, good morning to wherever you are. Martin, great to see you again after, I think we did this last time, uh, very early this year, January, February this year. It's, and it's, it's roughly as cold, yeah. It, it roughly as cold. Uh, a lot of change in the meantime. I moved my house and family here from Germany to Switzerland, so it's 10 o'clock here at night, and I look forward to chatting again with a whole global Reedsy community. It's it's a force out there, the the author, Reedsy author for, for us. Really great to talk to you guys again. Amazing. Well, we're really happy to have you on. Really pleased you uh, you said uh, you'd uh, share this presentation with us. Uh, you, I know you've got a lot to get through, so I'm going to dip off. Uh, and when you're ready, just let me know. I'll throw your slide deck up. Yeah, you know, I, I'd say without further ado, I, I was already here a couple of minutes and saw the uh, people coming on board, you know, all sorts of genres. The whole global planet is listening. So uh, this is going to be a great session. I hope we have enough time for also Q&A so that we can cover uh, a couple of your have genre specific questions. I'll try to cover, I you know, read a couple of genres that came up here in the chat and I'll try to tailor some of the examples we use and the data we use as we go go along to what, what I heard. So I hope you can take the most out of it. And as you said, Martin, there's a whole lot of material to get through. Part of the material was presented uh, at 20 Books Vegas, where I met with Ricardo. And basically, this is the, the first audience, you know, after the conference to really get this material, but also some more detailed, you know, things that came up due, uh, due to the questions that also came up uh, in discussions uh, in between sessions at the conference. So this is hopefully the latest and greatest we have here. Let's dive right into the agenda. Basically, we cover a lot of topics that you've read in the in the uh, trailer to this webinar, but you know, by and large, we're going to cover four big topics. We're going to briefly talk about market forces and. You know, excuse that I use such a fancy term. It's going to be simple. Uh, no worries. I'm going to talk about the latest market numbers. You know, what's going on for the indie publishing world out there and opportunities and trends across genres. And then, as said, dive into the questions and answers. So the audience here, I hope, obviously, you're as tense and as excited as the two people here. Usually, I get this type of reaction when I mentioned the very word data. So don't worry, I'm going to make it easy, very palatable, and hopefully also uh, a little bit of fun. All right. So let's dive into our first agenda point, harnessing market forces. And many of you, especially if you whatever have not studied economics or something, are going to say, well, harness what? And it's, it's basically very, very easy. You know, my best example of this whole meta is when when I was a kid, you know, I'm I'm basically a kid of the 80s. I was a young boy in the 80s, and uh, the thing you had to have at the time was this thing here. I hope you can see it. It's the my early experience in market forces, the Rubik's cube at the time, which was a toy everybody had to have, and everybody had it um, except me. So my mother and I spent like two weeks running around toy shops trying to find this very item and I wasn't able to get it. So very early in my life, I was um, exposed to these forces of supply and demand, if you will. And I noticed there are trends and you don't want to be on the wrong side of supply and demand. And these trends, they come and go, and they, the, you know, there are huge searches of demand. They are satisfied by and certain authors who write in certain genres, and it does exist in the in the book market as well. Let's, you know, let's take an example here from the book market. Mm, how about this year? Very simple. Uh, market forces in genres and submarkets. This one graph here you see on the left hand side, the one picture, the red one, is Basically, from 2009 to 2019, a 10-year period the, showing the Google search interest for the paranormal romance search term. And you see, you know, there was a huge peak back in, you know, it was like 2011 or something and then trailing off. Does that mean that, you know, overall interest for um, paranormal romance is dying off? No, it certainly doesn't because vampires never die, as we know. And there are certain other subgenres that, you know, although in absolute terms, maybe much lower in search volume, 
you know, show, show different patterns. So you see here, just as an arbitrary example, shift of romance as a subgenre within paranormal romance, which was basically taking almost an opposite course, having then a much lighter peak. So it's it's very key as a especially as a you know authorpreneur, somebody who who wants to reach an audience to to gauge what the audience is doing, where the audience is going, taste wise. And this is what we are trying to do when we talk about harnessing market forces. Give you another example to expand a bit uh, ar around this concept. So, and this is about bringing supply into the equation. What you see here, the blue line, is this one thing which you know started popping up a couple of years back in Facebook groups: the reverse harem. Uh, genre or trope basically you know where you have one heroine and a couple of guys around here it can be it can be sci-fi and fantasy it can be romance it can be erotica it can be lit rpg uh, many genres by now make use of this basic trope also why choose romance because the heroine doesn't choose and that's very important to the authors in the genre now what you had here if you t look at this plot from 2008 all the way up to now you had this period of like unserved interest where basically the interest was not so much here in the western book market but it was all in like korean manga and comics uh on also japanese ones where this trope was getting big and then sort of you know 2014 2017 those years you had you know a big hype in interest but hardly anybody writing in the genre those were like the super golden times and what you see then here in red in orange were the number of KU and non-KU books coming into the market every month. And you see as of 2018, the market has started to flood with a supply of books. So this is where the demand is now met by a book supply. And I'm not saying this, that this is getting saturated, but you see how these two factors start playing together. And the leading authors in the genre then always go about, well, what is the next wave going to be? And that's what you also have to think of it almost like a movie producer. What is that next theme? And for example, in this case, if you just look at the book supply, they create are creating the next wave, which is Academy Romance here. Uh, this The yellow lines or yellow bars showing the monthly new titles coming in into this subgenre. So this is a, you know, I'm not saying you should write this. This is just a completely arbitrary example to illustrate this whole point of market forces where you have a supply of books and the demand of books. And obviously you want to be on one of these genres where the demand is A, growing, and hopefully where the supply of books is not yet overly crowded. So with this, and, and by the way, in case you ever find yourself on the wrong side of the equation, there's always solutions. This is the solution I used back then when I finally did get my uh, my Rubik's Cube at the time. All right. So this is a bit the whole concept of market forces. And what I'd like to do now is let's, you know, lean back and take a big after we dove into this level of detail, let's lean back and go back to a high level where we look at the, say, the overall climate, if you want, for all the, you know, indie authors, hybrid authors, and traditional authors out there for that matter. So what is the big picture right now? Um, the latest data you get from the American Association of, of Publishers, the AAP, is here the traditional publisher's view on the book market, what you have here in front of you. And this is their total trade revenue over the last three years. And you see 2017, 18, 19. First of all, good news for everybody in the book market. The market is growing and has grown with about more than 4% year on year. But if you go into the details, there's two major, actually three major things, I think, from the many numbers here on this very graph you should take away. So next to the growth, um, you see an orange and light orange area that is print books, hardback and paperback mass market. So this is revenue here. And you see that out of these $8.1 billion that are generated in trade revenues with books in the US by traditional publishers, you see the bulk of the money they earn comes from paperback and hardback. And in fact, this is also where the numbers come from when you, when you sometimes read in the newspapers or in the uh, in the media uh, that ebooks, for example, are shrinking. Well, that is their numbers. They don't care so much about 
ebooks and all, or, or obviously overprice them in order not to cannibalize that big yellow area that you see in this graph. So that's the uh, second takeaway. The third takeaway, there's one blue area, and we're going to dive into that a little more in detail, which is the blue area audiobooks. And you see that one has been growing uh, two years in a row with more than 30% per annum. So traditional publisher view on ebooks, well, um, basically a shrinkage in the market. But there is a big problem with these numbers because these numbers are made up by a panel of some 2,000 traditional publishers in the US. And basically, there is a couple of guys are not in the panel. And one company in specific that is not part of the panel is Amazon. Now, guess what? Amazon, the rumor goes, holds by now more than 85% of the ebook market in the US. So, this yellow, num the, excuse me, these red numbers here, you know, are by no means representative. And if you walk over to Amazon and just look at their, at their publication of the, just as one part of the ebook market, the Kindle Select Global Fund, which is obviously all the royalties paid to Kindle Unlimited authors, you see that if you add all these numbers together, first, thing you note is the, that by, I think, July this year, 1 billion US dollars were paid to Amazon Kindle Unlimited authors. And you see here a uh, year-on-year growth of 18% since 2016. This year is going to grow. We project it to be 304 million US dollars. And that is pretty significant. So take this as an alternative view on the ebook market. And then without getting like too deep into mathematics, but um, you know that as a Kindle Unlimited author, you are paid by the number of pages read, which is expressed in the uh, Kindle edition normalized page count. And that one, I know everybody's going in Facebook groups, oh, it's been growing, it's been going up and down. Well, the fact of the matter is that, you know, over the last three years, it's been fairly constant. If you put an average through it, you're earning about $4.65 per thousand pages read, which also gives you a bit of a picture of what the value of, say, a 250, 300 um, page book is in terms of royalties. But the point is, if you have the total size of the pie in terms of $300 million this year, and you know what the pages read are and what the price is, you can compute the number of ebook pages read every year ever since that scheme was introduced. And you see here we computed about a 19% growth in the basically demand of pages read in billion pages. So imagine 65 billion book pages read 2019 in Kindle Unlimited, which is fairly significant. Now, the big question is how much of a market does that Kindle Unlimited represent? Well, the overall supply of books in Kindle Unlimited is about um, a third of the overall Amazon book market. Overall market is about 6 billion books, excuse me, 6 million books, English speaking titles. A third of that supply is Kindle Unlimited. But in terms of the royalties generated, because these titles tend to rank higher, we computed that uh, out of that 19% growth, about 11.5% were basically generated by Kindle Unlimited gaining share and another 7.5% roughly, and these are estimates uh, generated out of underlying ebook growth. So a much different picture about ebooks when we look at the Kindle, uh, Kindle platform and Kindle Unlimited in specific. And one pretty striking data point is we computed the share of royalties across the top 100 bestseller lists across 30 main categories back in 2016 and then in 2019 based on you know data of thousands and thousands of books their respective sales ranks and the royalties that you can estimate from those sales ranks and guess what the share of kindle unlimited books has grown by, from 45 percent share of royalties to more than 60 percent this year, which is quite striking. So, you know, for anyone, this does not say, you know, if you're wide, you know, you have to do KU or if you, you know, this is, but this is one part in this overall equation you have to look at when you make that sort of assessment. And as always, the story very much also uh, um, changes by genre, but the one point is 
we often get then conspiracy theories around, well, is Amazon in any way manipulating the manipulating the algorithms to prefer Kindle Unlimited books? Uh, we have a very clear verdict on this, although we don't know the details of the algorithm, but our very strong hypothesis is a clear no. Um, the reason why Kindle Unlimited is basically earning share is because it is a matter of conversion. Because on the left-hand side, on this picture, you have the typical buy button for a purchase book, in this case, a very expensive one at that. From a psychological point of view, from a buyer's point of view, a Kindle download, Kindle Unlimited download is always a free book. Yes, you paid the subscription, but once you're on the site, it's like a free download, psychologically speaking. So both However, both purchases and downloads drive the sales rank. So it's almost like baked. It's not that they prefer KU in the algorithm, but it is that basically the mechanics of Kindle Unlimited acting almost like a free download from a conversion point of view, it there will be more downloads and they in turn drive more sales ranks. That lets the KU books climb up in the charts and that in turn generates more traffic for KU. So it may even be inadvertently be baked into the algorithm that over time, Kindle Unlimited is, is gaining share. And that gets you to a picture by now, which looks like this genre by genre for the big genres that you have genres like romance where 80%, that is 80 titles out of the top 100 titles at any point in time are basically Kindle Unlimited books or you go to mystery thriller suspense, although heavily contested by traditional publishers, half of the books approximately are Kindle Unlimited. And you have a, also a very high share of KU in sci-fi and fantasy as well as teen and young adult, just as another two examples. So this gives you a little bit of a perspective of what is happening overall in the market and the question is, well, how do you best participate? And uh, next to the supply and demand equation, are there are certain data points learning from our work with the data that we do for our members, that we do in our monthly category performance database, where we can hopefully extract a couple of insights that you guys might find useful and actionable uh, going forward. So again, if we look overall at that pie of royalties and that is a picture some of you may already know i've been using it before but just to re-illustrate we have a pretty swamp market as illustrated by the mountain on the left hand side that's the mountain we have to climb the mountain represents those you know more than six million english speaking titles and if you get to the very top of the mountain the peak that would be your you're a number one bestseller and the, say the first 50,000, not the first 50,000 books, but the first 50,000 rank positions probably drive almost close to 90% of all the sales um, of all the money that you see on the right hand side here as a whirlwind of dollar notes. So let's have a look, you know, who these days um, are about, are amongst the best rock climbers, if, if you want. And we have here, first, if we break it down by genre, what we did look at, we looked at some 50,000 titles of the last uh, three years, looking at the top 100 rankings and looking at what is the share of the top 100 rankings achieved, what genres achieve, get all the way up there on top of the mountain where really the bulk of the money is, is earned. So first, the umbrella category, literature and fiction, 32%. Now, that is pretty non-telling because it is like in a big umbrella category where almost every book is categorized in. Then romance is basically the lead market on the Kindle platform, followed by mystery, thriller, suspense, followed by sci-fi and fantasy. Then also about the same order of magnitude, non-fiction, then teen and young adult, and then you get all the other 25 big major um, bestseller lists that you have. So well done for you know all the romance, MTS, and sci-fi authors out there. And also, if you're a teen young adult, obviously you're serving all these genres, but just you know more confined to a certain certain age group, age target group. The other way of cutting the data is well, 
out of all these books that make it all the way to the top, well, what type of authors are they? And we basically weeded through, I think, you know, more than 8,000, 10,000 publisher names, discerning whether it is a big five, an imprint of the big five, an Amazon imprint, or whether it is uh, basically an indie, a smaller publisher or, and, or an indie publisher. And what we have here is also, I think, where all the indie publishers and indie authors amongst you can really give yourself a tap on the back. Because what we find is that indies, um, they, out of these top rankings, 38% of the top rankings, so the lead segment is by now indie authors on Amazon Kindle, followed very strong by now Amazon imprints, you know, with its big imprints such as, you know, um, Thomas and Mercer, such as Montlake Romance, you name them. Uh, then the big five and all their hundreds of imprints and then other publishers. So well done to all of you out there. I think that is really a, an amazing achievement. And, you know, when Ricardo and I, Ricardo from Rizzi and I were at, at Vegas at the big indie conference, you could really sense, you know, the energy in the room that is behind and reflecting these numbers. So ample opportunity out there. As always, the story varies, but by genre, um, we have very strong performance of the indies, in particular here in the, in the, if you go into the details of this graph here, in romance, extremely strong. Then mystery thriller suspense, a bit more contested there. The Amazon imprints are extremely strong by now. Um, Nonfiction, there we see more of the traditional big fives. Again, back to sci-fi and fantasy and teen young adult, clearly the lead position is held by indie authors. And I think that is really a fantastic achievement. If you look at, you know, more than half of the top bestseller lists at any point in time being populated by, by indies. So with this, we got a couple of questions also, you know, uh, before we went into this webinar. So, you know, let's go into a couple of more detailed things that you may be wondering about. If I also follow the questions that we have in, in Facebook groups, there is always a question, hey, what about series versus non-series? Well, we also had data on this one. So for example, our series gaining share well, if you look at the compound data across all the 30 categories, it may not be that clear there. The share has increased from some 25% to 27%, which on first sight may not look like a big number. I'll mind you if a Pepsi Cola is gaining two percentage point share over, over Coca-Cola, you know, that's a big thing in the consumer market. So, but even if you say, well, that's not so significant, if you do break it down by genre, there is two important insights one is that there are certain genres such as romance such as mystery thriller suspense even more so sci-fi and fantasy where also you know more than a third in some cases half of the top 100 bestseller rankings achieved are by now achieved by series um i do believe one of the main factors behind this is also that many of these rankings are achieved by way of advertising and, you know, if, if you advertise one book, you automatically advertise the whole series. So in many cases, the return on marketing investment and the, the build up of, build up of reader loyalty is just um, a major factor why series in the long run seem to perform so well. All right, so going from here, also one quick note about prices because that question, comes up very often on the price side here. We, without going into like all the super details, there's two things you need to take away. One is on this chart here, this is the average prices across the top 100 bestseller lists measured over time for a whole year for a couple of major genres. And the first thing you need to take away, price points are different by genre. That's rule, not, rule number one. The specific thing you need to take away from this chart here is you see some red and green numbers. The red numbers tend to be the lower average prices, which were more in the year 2017 across the majority of genres. And 
ever since then, we've seen basically a re-increase of prices all the way up to this year. So also this, I think, is good news for all authors and publishers involved. Second point, though, is this is average prices. So obviously, you don't price your book at such odd prices. What you're more interested in are what are the typical most frequent price points that you see in certain genres. Also, here the message is the genres vary. So just as an example, on the left-hand side here on the screen, you see various price points from 99 cents at the bottom all the way up to 999. And you see the most frequent price points in romance would be the 99 cents price point and the 399 price point. By contrast, in the middle, the green one, the most frequent sci-fi price point, 21% of the books are priced at 499. And then if you go to the right-hand side, MTS, you see here also much more other prices, which is you know sometimes higher prices as commanded by the traditional publishers contesting in the segment. Um, and you see also the 199 price point, pretty popular. Now, for those of you who are Kalytics members, this is here the most frequent price points. When we in our you know, membership area go into individual genres in our in-depth research reports, we also try to look at what are not just the most frequent price points, but what are the highest yielding price points, right? Because the total royalty is number of books sold times the price if you're not in KU, as an example. And so that can also uh, slightly differ from most frequent, but it gives you already a feel of where the genres are moving price-wise these days. All right, I hope I'm not going too fast, but you have a replay, and I hope you find this dense information uh, useful so you can put it into action when you do your own selling and marketing plans. Uh, one point about formats. Um, that is an interesting one because we saw earlier the traditional publisher numbers uh, for, the, for the different formats and their audio growing. Well, what we did and what you can do yourself, if you go into the category bestseller lists on the, um, I think it's here, amongst if you go bestsellers and more and then scroll down, you can click on print bestsellers. But the irony is that the print bestsellers are not print. So once you there click on romance, we found that, hey, there's hardly any hardback or paperback in those top 100. So basically, it is a cross-format uh, bestseller list that Amazon features there on the Kindle store. It is not a print bestseller list. And that, in turn, allowed us to look at the share of formats across the top 30 bestseller list as an example. And we already showed this back in 2017. This is the numbers from 2017. Um, you read the genres from top to bottom. At the top is romance, LGBT, MTS, literature and fiction. A very bottom, the blue line is audiobooks. Red is Kindle, yellowish is print, and blue is audio. This is how the graph looked like in 2017. This is what it just looked like a month ago. So also this confirms the continued growth of both eBooks and the Audible format, in this case, audio format, print getting more and more squeezed in the middle. And this graph here is not even weighted by sales. If we just cut out all these hardly selling um, non-fiction categories out there and just focus on the big high selling categories, I think we really get the story across. This is if we only filter out romance, mystery, thriller, suspense, literature and fiction, science fiction, fantasy, and teens. And um, I think that speaks, yeah, speaks for its own, you know, no, no comment. I mean, this is basically what the Amazon bestseller lists look like. And if you put that together with also the share of indies you have there, I think it clearly speaks a language as to uh, what is the way to go. Does that mean you shouldn't do print? It, no, it, you know, it just shows you where the bulk of the market is and where potentially some focus has to be if you are published on the Amazon platform. All right. So by the way, also for our members, we will be looking in detail um, over the next weeks. We showed some initial data 
um, in Las Vegas concerning audio data. So we also now have next to the ebook data, the audio data coming online um, for, for our members. So also to make more sense of that huge blue area that you just saw. Now, let's talk a bit more in depth now that we covered the whole of the market, um, a bit the genre opportunities and, and trends that we see out there. And here I'm working off from the data that we collect for our members like every month. Um, and, you know, I extracted some of the interesting trends to also make them available to you here. So, you know, let's dive right into it. One important point is if you work as an author and you work predominantly alone, then you know from your own books what your books are doing and you may want to infer certain trends going up and down. Um, if you are a part of, you know, groups like the Read Z group or like members of Facebook groups, you will often see that people talk about certain trends and that's, you know, really the thing to do as an indie author, you know, join forces with others to stay abreast of what's happening. Now, what we add to the picture, um, what we add to the picture is that we try to bring in here the, um, the insights of working with thousands and thousands of books. So we, we monitor thousands and thousands of books. There was like one question, by the way, on the, on the previous chart on does, uh, do printed books and Kindle books get counted twice in the chart? In many cases, not because the Amazon overall, all, overall format bestseller list will all, always default to the format that basically caused it to rank in the top 100. So in most cases, a romance book, it will be the ebook up there that was the cause of the ranking. And um, some of these books don't even have a print edition. So usually there is no double counting in, uh, in there, except for, you know, obviously the usual suspects such as Harry Potter and, and, and you name it. So, but the point here is working with thousands of books we clearly see that there is a, a whole universe of, of opportunities out there for you. And if you just think of this sky here, the Milky Way, every star being a, a jar or a trope, you know, um, and you multiply that, it's, it's basically endless opportunities. What you, what you can do as an author with words, uh, what is meant to say here is, is basically unlimited. But, you know, we do know that some stars, if every star in the sky was a jar, some stars are a little bit brighter than other stars, right? And some stars have a little more population than others may have. So basically what you can say, if you have like two jars to choose off from, you could argue one star is one jar and the other, the red star is you know, a competing jar that you might be interested in writing in or, putting your advertising money in. And you could argue that if you had a map that tells you the higher the star above the horizon, the higher the level of sales as expressed here by the, um, the pot of gold, if you will, and the further the category or the genre is to the right of the horizon, the higher the level of competition. Since we have a lot of members in the US, you know, uh, this is a American football team in Europe. It would be soccer, I think in Australia, rugby or something, you take whatever, works for you to express the level of competition. The further to the right, the higher the level of competition. And this map, for those of you who know Kalytics, you know this picture where we basically say, okay, if it the, the ye yellow star in this case is higher up than the red one, so it has higher sales, and the red star is further to the right, so it also comes with higher competition. So the, the yellow star, the yellow genre would be clearly better than the red one. So if you take these two things together, we basically start computing here a whole map of the Kindle market, which is like more than 7,000 genres. We, um, and categories are just a first starting point to, you know, a crude measure to, to, to measure the certain health and overall status of a genre. Obviously, if you dive into categories, there are often misplaced books, uh, some, uh, what we call uh, category, uh, you know, category pollution, some call that. But, you know, the big picture is still 
fairly good across the board, especially if you uh, look at how are all the romance categories doing and some pockets of those versus, say, sci-fi and fantasy, etc. So here's your, your market. And we basically say in that market, you have areas where just as an illustrative example, you could go, for example, in the top right-hand corner, you have categories such as mystery, thriller, suspense, slash thrillers, where, well, the average sales rank across the top 100 over time is 44 out of 6 million books. So it's like ultra high, ultra high sales. But if you move to the right on that chart, it measures the level of competition as measured by the number of titles in the category. You see there are more than 100,000 titles in it. So many indie authors may say, ah, you know, that's a bit, it's high sales, big bang for the buck, but too competitive. How about things like teen young adult slash romance slash clean and wholesome, a very new category, a very new trend we see in teen and young adult, where you also have from the, the big trend, the adult trend, clean and young, uh, sorry, clean and wholesome romance, which was a big thing over the last two years, now going into a specific age group and we have amazon opening up a specific new categories sales rank across the top 20 tiles uh better than ten thousand in the store but at the point in time when we did this which i think was one and a half months ago only 450 english speaking titles in it and of course if you want to write biographies and memoirs about arts literature composers musicians country and folk music you're welcome to do so but mind you yes zero competition 28 books only in the category, but also basically zero sales, which however, for a nonfiction author, may be exactly the right strategy if you want to position yourself as the authority on country and folk music biographies. You get the idea. So with this, you know, let's look at some other of these, you know, um, yeah, here is poetry still at least a popular genre. I even may have poetry here. On this was the was the question so why by the way do these categories matter is both strategic and tactical the categories do matter because if you put a search into your search bar at the very top you know um, first of all Amazon drives a store a category driven book purchasing experience you know shop by category if you go into the overall bookshop um, some Kindle sites across the planet like Germany are also reflecting this structure. But more importantly, if you put in a search, part of the algorithm is the keyword, but another part of the algorithm, it will present to you books from the right aisle in the supermarket, which is, is it in the relevant category? So for example, if you type in paranormal romance, most of the books displayed will also be in the paranormal romance category. But back to these dots here and to give you uh, the people on the webinar some further examples this is for example the complete genre health as expressed by these position for the romance genre but an excellent genre still on on uh, kindle and you see here well there's you know like big what we call hot mainstream market very high sales like paranormal romance but also like hugely crowded but if you have the av advertising money it may be, may be exactly the right market to go into in the middle ground, uh, clean and wholesome romance, we reported uh, about it for our members in our reports over the last two years. And then if you go into certain age groups, such as teen, young, adult, C, sci-fi, dystopian. So there's the typical Hunger Game genres, which despite the big hype, there are still less than a thousand English speaking titles in the category. So this was romance, uh, Martin, let's do a couple more here. We have, mm, yeah, then by the way, you can also measure this over time. Just to give you an example here, this is paranormal romance as measured over time. And while we saw at the beginning, Google search interest had this huge peak uh, already way back, right? And then a bit of fading interest when we look at the Amazon data, we see a bit of a renaissance of um, paranormal romance going here into 2019, basically on the back of also big indie author uh, Bella Forrest with her, you know, next year, or she's Harley Merlin. And she was riding already the first wave, the first peak here with uh, Shades of Vampire. So um, that's coming back here. We see interesting trends over time. This is, for example, the red line is uh, the last five years of erotica sales in literature and fiction. 
and the blue line is the before mentioned romance clean and wholesome category and you see the one was shooting up the other down but now recently we see a bit of a leveling off as well as also leveling off here in the clean wholesome area and a bit of a you know coming come back here of erotica although it's highly restrictive on the advertising side of things which was probably one of the reasons for the dip here in the first place what else do we have here we had uh here in the chat we all yeah let's also look at uh, mystery thriller suspense so mystery thriller suspense overall genre health a very good genre to be in um you saw that yes there is competition from the big five but you see really a lot of indies also doing well in particular niches take um, if you take the very you know the indie example mark dawson well he's working here right in the in the sweet spot in the middle in the hot niche mystery thriller suspense crime fiction vigilante justice right with many of his books um there's a category here where you have sky high sales but the level of competition as measured by that one category and obviously the books are also categorized many others but if you take this as a crude measure shows you it is a high selling market but still a, a niche market we see many authors doing well in cozy mystery that has mo clearly moved into the mainstream but within those again there are certain niches take the witch cozy mysteries and um that are doing extremely well and are completely dominated by a by a few authors in the segment and i saw martin when people came on board here at the beginning um we had a whole number of authors with psychological thrillers well you know near that we have here a hot sale mystery thriller suspense thrillers domestic thrillers big thing right now um very few titles in the category and the sales are sky high um usually dominated also by a number of authors in the amazon imprint and they are really serving that trend there so something to watch out for we're probably going to make a special report soon for our members just diving into that very hot sell there good um cozy mystery as mentioned mainstream market but over the years you know agatha christie in the 2020s um, you know and the like very popular and i said also there a couple of niche markets to exploit um overall a positive picture here what else do we have here i brought um another one here for example why are cozy mysteries featuring featuring witches so well they are riding in my mind on two major mega trends and these mega trends are reflected by those two curves here in mystery thriller suspense the one is the red line which you basically see has all its ups and downs but if you put a trend through it it's clearly up and that's the uh the mystery women sleuths category so female protagonists combine that with an overall upward upward motion of mystery thriller suspense blue line paranormal suspense these are two big things so no wonder that if you then go into something such as cozy mystery that which is the paranormal side of things is doing well featuring strong female protagonists the strong women women sleuths there the smart women sleuths so this is what we do there this is by the way the vigilante justice one uh which we just mentioned it's been shooting up there ever since introduced and you know very stable up there so that is the jack reaches of the world for the mystery thriller suspense writers and oh my god look at this this is what we had in the chat here <laughs> who was it paul Mayo was asking is poetry still the least popular genre well paul i'm afraid it is not doing great on kindle with kindle as a sales channel you see lots of there are surprisingly actually a lot of poetry categories on there but you see the performance many of these rank worse than fifty thousand, worse than a hundred thousand in the kindle store and that means less than like a copy or so a day being sold all right uh, well obviously we could go on and on and on martin but you know this is at least a couple of these um nuggets for those people out there uh, science fiction obviously we should not forget sci-fi just as an example post-apocalyptic doing uh, still well you know but moving a bit into the mainstream here on the top right hand side then things like uh, also very indie dominated a lot of authors who are 
who were at the Vegas um, Vegas conference are in the military sci-fi space marine sci-fi area that's still here in the middle ground but you know high sales but also a significant number of titles coming in and yeah you see if you want to write about uh, liter literature and fiction literary criticism about science fi and fantasy that's obviously a non-topic and just here for illustrative purposes all right so what else do we have here let's see um fantasy we shouldn't forget i uh, noticed there's also a couple of fantasy out uh, authors out there in the audience today so just as one example uh, we mentioned already paranormal and urban a big mainstream genre by now so it's important you know what specific thing do you focus at is it the shifters is it the vampires is it the werewolves is it the you know what type of creatures do you look at and actually many of the urban fantasy authors have migrated their books into um into sci-fi fantasy dragons mythical creatures category um also myths and legends these sort of things so here middle ground and i saw also here in the chat we have magical realism authors out there it is here clearly a reflected trend in the teen young adult genre where you see this hot sell here magical realism as a you know teen young adult focused thing where we read certain media that report about the trend here is the facts behind it it's been doing very well like not super sky high sales but you know average sales rank across around fifty thousand and less than 500 english speaking book in the very category that um basically helps you position your book book there so i hope this gives you a bit of a feel of what the market currently is in our research obviously it doesn't uh, what we do for our members it doesn't stop at uh doesn't stop at categories we try to look uh beyond categories especially as you know you notice for you authors we still collect the data but for the authors out there the categories on the very book page have gone the books are still in categories and for those of you who are new to the subject you can get your book into more than two categories you know you're not confined by the uh, categories given to you in the KDP dashboard. You can get into up to 10 categories. Um, if you Google Kalytics, BISA codes, B-I-S-A-C, that's the industry nomenclature. It gives you an article on why that whole dilemma is on the, on the Amazon site and what you can do about it and how to get into the categories. We also may co cover it in the Q&A. And I think uh, also Reedsy has a very good article on it. So uh, beyond categories, but what you can do is there are obviously genres out there. I know some of you here in the chat also say you mix and match categories. So what we can do is we can look beyond categories by basically digging into things like, well, give me all the female protagonist thrillers, or how about bad boy romance? How about literature role-playing games and game literature? There are no dedicated categories for it, but basically what we do in our research is we do look at the occurrence of certain words tr say trigger words or i wouldn't call them keywords but certain clues um, through the use of certain words that can give you basically create whole virtual bestsellers for categories that do not exist and you can then even drive it a little further um, in our genre reports, then we usually also cover things like, uh, well, what are the, like the top selling tropes? So just to close off with one funny example is um, we covered recently our dystopian and post-apocalyptic literature report. And we went into all these titles and book descriptions and looked at, well, if there is an ap apocalypse to come, well, from a reader point of view, what should the doomsday be? And that was a pretty funny exercise, Martin, because we then got, okay, the zombies are no longer the favorite thing. You know, it's we will die from diseases, illnesses, or pandemics, or a big ele electromagnetic attack, some cold or frozen thing here in, in wintertime. It is going to be an attack or a solar thing or a virus bacteria. So we sorted all this by sales rank and royalties generated which was a pretty fun thing to do and then you know you can do the same thing in cozy mystery is it the witch is it the is it the where does the crime happen is it the uh, is it the mansion is it the cruise ship is it the beach um, what resonates with the reader fun exercise and we we hope to you know drive that further in the 
coming uh, in the coming year. So in summary, you know, before we then also go into the Q&A, what can you, what should you take from that? First of all, I mean, you are creative people. So your first priority will always be on the writing. But then you're also business people, as in the authors, you are in the publishers for that matter. And obviously you can use data, in my mind, for two major things. One is strategic, here the chessboard, what shall I write or what direction should I give the genre I'm working? Or some of you may even post a very strategic question. I've been writing whatever romantic suspense for the past 10 years. I like romance, but I want to do something else. Shall I go into sci-fi or into MTS? These sort of questions, or it can get very tactical into what 10 categories to put my book into. So you can use data for both of them. And I encourage you, encourage the business side in you to do so because you know every every indie publisher is a publisher and a publisher is a business and a business is there to work with the market data and you know get a feel of what's happening having said this don't bend yourself it's always very important to say um, at the end of these webinars because there's terms out there such as you know right to market well what does that mean it whether you are in there for the money or the recognition by the audience, you want to reach an audience, right? But how do you do so? I personally think, first of all, it is the love you bring for a certain subject. You know, if you don't love what you write, don't do it because it's not going to be sustainable. You need to have a good craft. You need to be a good writer and you need to bring a certain knowledge. So it is no uh, use for me telling you, hey, um, legal thrillers are a really good thing if you neither love them nor you know how to write the style, nor do you have any knowledge about legal proceedings. That doesn't work. But if you have all these things in place, you want to match it with the market and be good at the marketing in and for such market. And that is what we call the magic zone. We cannot help you with the top things. That's where also you come in yourself, where Readsy and its services helps you. We come in here in the green zone of this whole thing to match what you have with the data so that you can bring these things together. So this is basically where the creativity and success is happening. Um, Martin asked me, what do we do in this respect? I can show a little bit more also during the Q&A, but essentially, you know, we provide you with that map to the stars by means of our Kalytics Elite database, which covers every month updated the complete data on all 7,000 genres categories that are out there down to level five. And for those of you who are not into numbers, we all take you by the hands in videos such as this one here, where we take you by the hand and get take you through the whole research in one specific genre. So there is like a cozy mystery report, a clean roll, a clean and wholesome report, and so on and so forth. We can I can show you a little more if Martin wants to at a lighter point. the The main thing is um, the sky is really the limit. You know what you can do with words, sentences, your creativity, and with this market out there is still a huge opportunity and you know we discussed it in las vegas i i think you know the story just begun the story has for indie authors has it become more difficult uh, do you need more investment on do you have to act more like a business yes but i think the opportunities are still out there so this is basically was the main part of the presentation i hope you enjoyed this and i will try to get through as many um as many pages that we can uh, uh sorry as many questions we covered the pages but cover also some of the questions before the hour martin and for those of you who are also interested while we do so um there is free re resources there is two sample webinars out there uh, one is very pertinent to the season. We have Christmas romance, we have Christmas mystery, and one report that covers all the 30 main genres. Pick and choose whichever you want or get them all. You can get them at kalytics.com slash readsy. And um, also there you will find a link to our Cyber Week special where um, also I discussed with Martin, if you do want to get, for example, a Kalytics Elite membership, if you get an annual membership there 
this is not meant to be a picture, but we have Cyber Week. And for all the REITs, the, the annual membership, which is like an all access pass, is $497 for a whole year. But we're going to throw in, if you buy this um, as a result of this webinar, just mail me. Um, you get six months for free as a REITC client. So that means you basically get the elite membership for the price of premium uh, when measured on a monthly basis. So um, with this, though, Martin, you know, let's try to cover uh, some questions as they may have come up. And first of all, I hope you guys enjoyed this huge dump of data and information. I hope you could make some sense of it. Let's see what people are saying here, Martin. Yeah, I've uh, pasted the link to uh, the sort of landing page you created on your website, which I think links to a couple of the reports and the uh, special Cyber Week uh, offer there. Um, while I sort of scroll through this, uh, the one thing I was wondering is uh, using uh, this sort of market data, how does that sort of affect how an existing author might choose to advertise their book? Yeah, that, that's that's a good one there as well, you know, because for advertising, what we, for example, do in the if you do your advertising, say, on the Amazon ads platform, you obviously have to inform your ads, for example, with either category bits or mostly we'll actually do um, the keyword bits, right? So in the data, uh, first of all, you, you see pertinent categories where you can place the books or that you can also use for advertising, although I think some authors may want to stay away for certain other reasons, which would be too uh, too deep to dive into for, for category ads. But when it comes to keywords, for example, in our in-depth genre reports, we list like leading authors in certain genres. So you can target authors, you can target other book titles. So um, uh, by now, you know, informing your advertising with what the market is very important. Another would be, by the way, which is often overlooked, is also things like Facebook Insights, Insights, not just the ad platform, but Facebook Insights, which in some cases gives a very good insight on what the audience is. You know, I mean, type in Cozy Mystery as an interest and you get a complete rundown of who these ladies are, how old they are, what they read, what shops they go into. So, um, you know, I think advertising should be informed by data and there's a lot of data out there and this just covers some aspects of it. Now, I can't find one specific question, but I know that a lot of the commenters uh, were asking about historical fiction. Uh, I know you probably don't have the numbers to hand, but uh, is uh, is there sort of quite a wide range of uh, sort of uh, well, you know, subgenres, I guess? Well, historical fiction, we, we do cover them actually in, in depth. Historical fiction, by the way, in general, still has been doing uh, very well. Uh, we know there are some fairly polluted categories because they tend to overlap a bit. But if you go just into, uh, let me use here my my uh, the, the database here, historical um, fiction, right? Um, now within historical fiction, you see from children's books, you know, starting, which is obviously not the the point of interest for many. But let's say if we filter out. Um, children and we filter out comics and manga just focus on literature and fiction teen young adult let's even take teen young adult out for the moment you see historical fiction breaks down into, god knows that's like 25 categories or so and if i move over to the right there's a lot of data but you see here i mean right now um if i try to make this a little larger um pot we actually can't see, i can't actually see that well oh, you can't see the screen yeah. um, let me I let me just switch the screen here. Uh, it's it only sharing. Well, basically, what I just did, Martin, was if you um, I think I would have to sh sh stop sharing this screen here. Yep. Uh, let me just try remove this one and then here share again. Here we go. I I have to share like an individual screen. I now reckon. So here it is. So basically, what I did here is I typed into our a monthly database of all the 7,000 categories I typed in historical fiction and then filtered out children's comics and teen young adults. So that leaves me just here with the, uh, with the big, um, with the big fiction data points, right? So it, it breaks down, you see here in African ancient, whatever. But the point I wanted to make is if you scroll over, um, if we sorted this, for example, by, 
ascending sales ranks. So the top segments, the highest selling ones at the top, highest selling ones would be historical women's fiction, historically United States, mystery thriller suspense, currently very big. And if we look at the positioning on that strategic map, um, competitive bestseller, hot mainstream, hot mainstream, hot sales. So basically all these uh, ratios that we have here, um, whoever asked the question, I, I know there are a couple of historical fiction authors out there, and there is a separate table like this for historical romance for that matter, which is in a completely own um, own category. So um, yeah, there is, you know, it's doing well, and it's doing well across segments, you know, whether it's World War II, whether it's Regency, you name it, um, it's, it's a very good market to be in uh, the, these days. Uh, cool. Uh, we have one question from Fit Lauderdale. Uh, can you please provide uh, the information about getting the right categories? I guess, like, uh, uh, in a nutshell. In well, in a nutshell, you know, um, the the point is the the KDP dashboard is basically based on certain industry codes, and those industry codes don't match the front end they don't basically don't match the front end of what you see in the store right so basically what you can do is that you instead of using these kdp categories you can basically contact um you can contact um kdp or author central basically tell them the exact category path you want your books in or where the book should be removed uh, removed from. I think I even had, or I uh, might even have the link for people ready so they can uh, can basically have it. I do. I thought I do have it here. I do, actually. So I'm trying to share my screen. If you do share it, Martin, sure. there are two two ways of people to get into the categories. There's the US example, and it works similarly in in the in the UK. So what do you see on the left hand side? Give me a second. It's taking a moment just to uh, push to upload. So basically, there's two ways of, of of going about it. And what you see here, I can now see it on my shared screen here. So on but the left hand side, with uh, them yet, just uh, it's taking a moment. Oh, I see. Well, then just in the voiceover, and later on it may pop up. But you can go on the one side onto Author Central. Uh, they basically say, how can you help you with my books, you know, browse categories, and then they actually prefer you to call them and they give a phone number there or a, 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 or a, yeah. give you a call. A transcript that we'll send around because, uh, yeah, I think that's one of our sort of uh, standard uh, suggestions for when you uh, set up your author central page or you set up your product page there. Exactly. And, and the other way is basically... Basically, Kindle got so many requests that they also established now more firmly the right-hand side, where they even have like a pre-written, a pre-written um, form, if you will, email that you can send to their support. Um, the, the only challenge is that if you go on Amazon right now and you, you wanted to look at, you know, any any book page, the issue is that. At the bottom of the book page, they remove the complete category path. So to say it is literature and fiction, it is women's fiction, it is romance, it is whatever regency, that whole path would have to be communicated to them. And, uh, well, you know, I don't want to make you buy my product just for that reason, but we have the whole category path still in there. So it's uh, at least one way of looking it up and also selecting which ones would be the bigger categories, the smaller categories, higher performing, lower performing, you name it. But the clue is don't restrict yourself by what you see in the KDP dashboard. That is the most important point. Okay, I'm just going to take one more question. I'm just quite, uh, conscious of the time. This one's from Mel. Uh, can you weigh in on KU versus broader ebook distribution channel strategy, Ingram Spark? I think not Ingram Spark, but. Yeah, I mean, obviously, if you go into the other platforms, whether, you know, whether it is uh, uh, the Apple books, whether it's the Google Play and, you know, Kobo, you name it. Um, I tend to say, first of all, it depends a bit on genre. There are certain genres and within genres, like certain sub genres that are like really the readers are in KU. So one thing you talk to other authors, where is the audience? That is one thing. The other thing, though, is 
you know, especially if you're a beginner, you don't want to be a master of five platforms at the same time time right so i always recommend you know start with one and many will start with the amazon platform and then i think the more proficient amongst you there is also strategy good to go in and out of ku that you use the ku platform for a certain period of time to get gain initial visibility and then you go wide or you play it even the other way around you go wide for a certain visibility and then in the end of the day everybody buys on amazon anyway so you go the other way so these are the type of plays you can have in the back of your mind okay fantastic uh cool uh, i think we're almost good to wrap it up is there anything uh, else you want to mention alex before we head off yeah i mean as said you know check out the uh, link that um that basically uh, Martin gave you, which is not here slash pricing, but you will end, if you do go to the pricing side, you will end up on that page. And as said, the offer stands for a Reedsy client. If you go for a Kalytics Elite annual membership these days, um, you will get for the next week, like six bonus, free bonus months on top. So I invite you to do so. And even if you don't wanna buy anything and just you know get your feet wet, um, how do certain genre seminars look at look like? You know, please do go to kalytics.com slash readsy, and from there you will basically uh, basically get a um, you know lots of free resources. And I think Martin, the the other thing is, I mean, you and I we talk, you Ricardo and I uh, talk, and I I think the the whole point is that we try to be as accessible as um, possible for um, questions that, that you may have. So, you know, if you do have questions, uh, please don't hesitate to, uh, to reach out. Um, my email, you can always write to support at kalytics.com, put into the, into the overall uh, chat box, you simply uh, put to Alex or put read the webinar and I'd be, you know, more than um, happy to answer your questions. I just put it up here. I hope it loads up, but um, you get here the link once more and especially my address, email address, Martin. So um, I don't know whether on YouTube I can may be able to follow up on a couple of questions and we'll yeah, do so. I believe you should be able to if you just go onto the actual channel itself. Uh, you could probably follow, yeah, I believe followed up on there. I'm not sure whether they get notifications. I'm still quite new uh, to the YouTube game but if you guys still have questions you can stick around alex uh, we'll be around for that exactly yeah. Yeah. i'll try to stick around a bit and answer some questions and the other thing is here you know uh check out the the free resource on kelly so come read the if you then get questions or have them right away do write me to support at kalytics.com put in the headline like to alex or read the webinar and it will be channeled to me and i uh, it, it's gonna hopefully uh uh you know I will try to get back to you as soon as possible. All questions are welcome. Yeah, so yeah, one of the things I really love about the indie book world is nobody's ever trying to hide any information or knowledge from each other uh, or sort of make you pay just to find out something that's on their mind. Uh, knowledge is, is, is very free flowing. I think that's probably one of the reasons why we're seeing uh, such, a, such a, a spike in the number of quality books that are being put out and readers who are receiving them well. Uh, I just want to have a quick plug before we head off. Uh, our next Read D Live is the last one of the year. It's in two weeks. Uh, it's one of our uh, book cover critiques where we bring on uh, a book designer from the Read D Network. Um, if you have a cover you've designed or had someone design for your book, you can submit it to covers at readd.com uh, and uh, you have the chance to have it featured live on the next webinar uh, and have it uh, lovingly ripped apart and uh, given suggestions for how to improve it. It's uh, always a lot of fun, and uh, I've dropped the link to it uh, here on the chat somewhere to the Eventbrite page. So sign up for it, and uh, you'll find instructions for how to send in your cover. Thank you very much again, Alex, for this. It was so informative. Uh, we'll have the transcript up in just a few days, uh, but thank you for sticking around, uh, and uh, goodbye, both of you. Uh, well, not Thank you very much. Goodbye. See you next time. Uh, see you.